ladies and gentlemen, this is Alice in Beijing. I'm so glad to meet you on the Friday evening. I can add the touch, connect the world and the universe. We are so proud, you know, to have all of you every Friday to meet on this global online talk. <laughs> Uh, I can actually talk. There is a new kind of global online talks for the science and technologies. Every week, we invited the top scientists from worldwide to deliver their research, the latest result, and to share with all of you. So I can actually talk. There is a new thing. It's a talk for science. It's a talk for technology. It's a talk to try to connect you and me in the universe. So AKX Talks has got a lot of attention on this. And uh, everyone knows that we are so proud, you know, to have, uh, to be one part of a global open talks for Peking University. Uh, actually, Peking University, everyone knows that the world leading university. And uh, they have host a new event, the global open talks. This talks uh, shot as X lessons. We invite scientists, socialists, artists, and all this to get online to give talks. So I can X talks is one part of global open talks for the technical part. So in last few weeks, we got, you know, uh, five weeks, we got 10 speakers on uh, ICANN Talks uh, stage. So all of them are from a different place and uh, they deliver very nice talks. So we named that as, you know, some Superman was fighting on the stage to show the latest results. So it's a lot of, you know, new things to come out. We're proud of that we have all of these top scientists here. And we not only have the top scientists to deliver the talks, after their talks, we have the students volunteer, you know, from a different place, different universities to write the technical report for all these talks. So this was contained uh, for, you know, five weeks. Every speaker on this stage, you will have a very detailed, very nice technical report. So we name it as Global Science Talk. Excellent, you know, technology, technical report. We want to share with all of you this latest technology. We want to get more people, you know, to love the high tech. We want to make the science as fashion. We make all these scientists as superstars. So all these students, the volunteers, they did a wonderful job. So if you are interested in this technical report, please scan the code and you can get the report. Uh, it's very pretty work. It's very helpful for you to understand all this work. This will continue to get on this I can X talks at series. So uh, every week after uh, the talks, we will deliver the technical report. So please keep follow us on this. And and uh, after this, yeah, we have uh, the uh, Twitter for I can access talks. So if you are not in mainland China, in the overseas or any other countries, you are uh, easily to join us to follow us and Twitter. I can access the talks. Uh, you can look at all these, watch all these videos replay on the YouTube. Also, <coughs> just search for I can access the talks. You can find all these videos. Uh, now for better help, for better understanding of uh, what you want, we have an online survey. So uh, you can scan the code. Or you can, you know, easily to find on the Twitter account for this uh, link, how to, you know, do the online survey. We really need your feedback because your feedback will, you know, help us to get more good service and invite the, the right speakers, uh, in, uh, the right topics and, uh, you know, to do good things uh, for all of you. So please, yeah, remember, you know, do this online survey and follow us on Twitter by I can actually uh, talks and uh, watch the replay of all these videos and YouTube. Uh, so this week, as normally this week, we have uh, two speakers. The speakers will be the same. Uh, the special topic this week is really a magic because they will talk about magical wood science. 
Normally we think that, you know, the science is something always, you know, high cap, but a wood, how to do with a wood for this science? But, you know, this super scientist, they made not only the wood as such, they make ma like magic, you can, you know, deliver and change hmm. all this wood into different kind of uh, skills and make really strong and make some special functions. So if you have any questions for this magic wood, so please post your questions in the meeting room, or if you couldn't assess it with a meeting room message functions, you can ask the question on Twitter. <coughs> so on Twitter and the I can add the talks, we will pick up the questions for you too. So please remember, yeah, uh, ask the questions. Yeah, we need, uh, we want, we love to, you know, get more questions, uh, get more interactive with uh, the scientists. So the magic wood science is today's topic. So the first speaker get on the stage uh, is one very interesting speaker. Her name, uh, his name is Liang Binghu. It's from Maryland uh, University. So, um, he really, really magic because he chose a special topic of wood and then he made so many different, you know, types of wood as science. So I published a paper on science on that year and, uh, you know, get a lot of attention on this. So Liang Bing, the word is yours. Please share your screen. We're looking for your, your wood nanotechnologies. Liang Bing, please. Uh, thanks, Ed, for uh, the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Niang uh, Binghu uh, from Hubei, uh, Jianli, uh, China. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to have this opportunity uh, to share our research uh, related to on this uh, wood. Uh, it's a very uh, common material. Uh, it's a very old material, but we're trying to find new opportunities uh, when we look done at the nanoscale. So I also have a, a startup company uh, called InventWood uh, to commercialize uh, the technologies uh, we invented at the uh, University of Maryland. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, first uh, introduce my research group at the uh, uh, University of Maryland, uh, which is actually at the Washington DC uh, area. So I also welcome- Yes. Uh, please share your screen. We couldn't see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, can you see the screen now? Uh, it's coming. Yeah, let me see. Almost. Ah, oh, yeah. Here it comes. Please. It's the. It's a. It's a maximized. Yeah. Is it a full screen? Yeah, it is. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, sorry, sorry about that, Alice. Uh, again, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to introduce our work related on wood nanotechnologies. Uh, so first of all, I would like to take a, um, um, a few moments uh, to discuss my research group, overall research. Uh, I'm leading a group focused on material innovations and manufacturing. And I personally strongly believe, uh, you know, these days uh, technologies, new technologies always come along with uh, material uh, innovations. New materials very often can enable new technologies. Um, and very often after the material innovation, you know, uh, there's a manufacturing challenge. So uh, I spent a few years in Silicon Valley uh, working for a startup company uh, doing rotary printed electronics. Basically, to take the nanoscale material like a carbon nanotubes and make them into inks, and you do this rotary printing for flexible, uh, low-cost electronics. So I, I you know, um, because of that research experience, very often I take a manufacturing aspect uh, into my research uh, portfolio. So um, currently, my group uh, is working on three major research directions. Uh, the first one is called the wood nanotechnologies, which I will uh, elaborate today. Uh, and we treat uh, wood or cellulose as a new material platform and to engineer this material to tailor the optical, mechanical, you know, ion transport and fluid behaviors in this wonderful materials. 
and particularly we are looking into the nanoscale behavior and we, we are looking into the new possibilities of this old material by starting in a new region of uh, uh, this hierarchical uh, structure. So the second reason my group is doing a lot is about the batteries. And we're very fortunate to choose the right topic, I believe, is about the solid state batteries. And using ceramic electrolyte instead of organic electrolyte, uh, we can potentially address uh, the safety and energy density uh, aspect at the same time. Very often we will increase the energy density of a battery and the battery material, the battery device itself become potentially more dangerous because you have more energy in a very small volume. If you have a fire because of the organic natural light, you have you know, even more severe uh, consequences. And the last aspect uh, my group is working on is called manufacturing. Um, um, and I'm very proud of this new research direction. Uh, we uh, uh, you know, started about six, five or six years ago. And we, invent this, we invented this process called uh, extreme high temperature uh, uh, you know, thermal shock by turning the duration of this high temperature uh, process. Uh, we can make all kinds of very interesting materials. Yeah? So the logic is very simple. Yeah? So when you're trying to make new materials, right? you want to make it fast. The easiest way to increase the speed is to increase the temperature. So for example, if you increase the temperature from 500 to 3000 by six times, you can increase the reaction rate by more than 10 million times. So that if you have a reaction, for example, if you're trying to make a glass window mm. that takes about 10 hours to make, you could potentially make it in within a second if you do everything right. So we are, actually exploring this new uh, manufacturing platform uh, for new material discoveries. And because it's very fast, so you can potentially manufacture it uh, you know, uh, in a very rapid scale. So I don't have time to talk about this research topic today, but you know, hopefully in the future, we have another opportunity to, to share this, uh, uh, the other, you know, this research portfolios. Yeah. So today I'm going to focus on the wood and the technologies. So, um, so if you look into the future, you know, uh, uh, you know, mankind is going to face a lot of challenges as we're facing right now, you know, this COVID-19 situation, right? So we need to be prepared for the future, right? And if you look at the challenges in the coming future, in the short-term or long-term futures, sustainability is going to be one of the top in the list, right? Sustainability, sustainable development and climate change, you know, as shown in this chart, is the number one thing, along with clean water, energy, you know, health issues, and so on. So address all these sustainability-related challenges. We have to use materials that potentially have this sustainability feature, right? So then if you look around, you know, there are two kinds of materials. The, the materials that are made by nature, like uh, leaves, you know, Gino is going to give a talk, you know, plants, you know, all this material that you know, made by nature every day. And they are biodegradable. That's one of the key uh, uh, feature of this category of materials. And the other category of materials are, you know, uh, human-made materials, like steel, glass. And usually they have very poor you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they exist in nature for hundreds of years. It's very hard to, you know, um, to, to get them completely disappearing. Uh, and, you know, not to mention uh, plastics, you know, that's another major uh, problem. All right, so, so for sustainable materials, I think one of the most abundant material is cellulose, and that exists in all kinds of trees, you know, plants, and uh, and you know, bamboos, as Alice was uh, mentioning. Um, and you know, on average, you know, in China, uh, you know, a person has about hundred trees. Okay, in <clears throat> in U.S., uh, you know, it's about seven hundred trees. In Canada, it's about nine thousand trees. Yeah. So globally, on average, you know, we have about 400 trees per person. So now it's really about how can we use this material, right? So now if you look at the tree, just if you stand, at, you stand in front of a tree and look at it, and you know this material is an endotropic uh, structure, means the tree grows at a certain direction. And if you zoom in further, you see this interesting 
porous structures, right? You have these tubular materials. You can see the channels here, right? And these tubular structures are glued together by this so-called lignin, right? It's like a glue. And that's actually why you have this wonderful uh, mechanical properties, the fluid transport properties in trees. The trees can grow in a very uh, large height, right, with, without breaking it up, even doing very uh, large wind uh, blowing uh, uh, to it, right? So, and people know this material for thousands of years, yeah, right? And if you take the ligni away between the tubes, you get these pops, the paper pops. And that's actually what the building block of this paper, right? And it's completely white, has a very good mechanical properties, flexible, very good for printing because of this power structure, it's tubular structure, it's hollow in the very center, right? right? So that's how far we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, be using these materials here, yeah, right? Um, you know that 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 has been a lot of development in the nanoscience and the nanotechnologies, and the people are always looking for nano uh, materials for enabling new technologies. And I was very uh, you know intrigued by the, the structures of the cell wall, right? If you look at the cell wall of these big tubes, okay, now you see these tiny tiny nano fibers with a diameter of about five nanometer, okay? Mm -hmm. So. So that you should be very excited when you see that, yeah. And they are partially aligned. And if you look into the structure even further, right, it's just like uh, you, you keep tuning the fiber, okay? If you have a magical hand, okay, if you keep tuning it, tuning it apart, you will see the fiber itself is made of even smaller fibers. And ultimately, it's made of this glucose chains, okay? With a length up to one micron, with a lot of hydroxyl groups on the surface, and as I said, this cellulose has a very long molecular chain. Is a, a, a you know a, a molecular weight is very very large. It's a Merkel uh, molecules, right? And you have the lignin. The lignin itself is much smaller, the same as hemicellulose. So I'm a physics by training. Uh, I don't know this material at all. When I actually uh, uh, you know got to know this material, I was more interested in how to use this cellulose fiber as a building block instead of the very complicated chemistry of ligand and hemicellulose. So my research really focused on the cellulose fibers using these materials. And we hope that by doing uh, engineering, you know, we can really take the advantage of nanoscience and nanotechnology and using this cellulose nanofiber as a platform. Everything else keep it the same, right? So just like many other uh, uh, material related technologies, there are two ways to process this material, right? So one is called bottom up, the other one is called top down. Yeah? So for the bottom up approach, you have to get these nanofibers. As I said, uh, you can get this nanofiber from wood, from grass, from bamboo, from sugarcane, and so on. Yeah? And typically we use this so-called pulp fibers, right? This is a big fiber, right? So we have to break them apart we have to tear them down into this nanofiber. We have two major steps. One is chemical approach. The other one is mechanical approach. So chemical, you functionalize the hydroxyl groups, the OH groups on the cellulose fiber, and you charge them up, up okay? You, you put a charge on the surface. So by doing so, they will start to repel each other. They will start to hit each other, right? So they will start to push against each other and then you follow up by the mechanical beeping, okay? You basically throw this pulp into um, like a wall, okay? Using this mechanical force to break them apart. So now in that case, you can get this wonderful cellulose nanofibers. It's like a gel, okay? It's now become very transparent because the diameter is very, very small. It's only a few nanometers. And remember, this is one of the most abundant nanomaterials, right? And it's actually a very cheap uh, research, I always, I do this research when I, uh, you know, uh, became an assistant professor at the University of Maryland about nine years ago. It's very cheap, yeah. So I think everybody can afford this kind of research, yeah. And you can literally just cut a tree and you can start a host everything. And I learned this material from Professor uh, Lars Wahlberg when I was still a postdoc at Stanford University with the e -Tray, uh, doing the battery research. We're trying to use this material for batteries. And and you know uh, there are a lot of development of using this cellulose nanofiber, 
And we have done a lot of work such as transparent nano paper, you know, nano cellulose batteries and so on. I, I won't have time to uh, discuss today. And when you use this nanomaterial, even though it's very cheap, uh, we did find a lot of potential challenges, right? Just like any other nanomaterial, it's very hard to process it. One of the major reasons is because we need to use a lot of water. Like for example, in this gel, it's about 98% is water. So that means, you know, even though the material is cheap, it's very abundant, the use of the water and the energy to break them down is going to be very expensive, right? So, uh, so about five years ago, I, I started to think about, you know, what are the potential manufacturing uh, routes to address these uh, um, issues? And as we look into that aspect, we found out the manufacturing research actually guide us to look into the the endoscopic feature of wood. And by doing so, we get actually more opportunities. For example, this is a piece of wood. It's a complete 100% of wood. Okay, there's nothing embedded inside. There's no uh, dye, there's no uh, color um, uh, uh, fillers and so on. And we get all this aligned cellulose fiber inside this so-called nano wood. And now you can imagine, you can tailor the channel length, you can tailor the optical properties, you can tailor the fluid transport, and so on. I think this become a new platform. So today I'm going to give you uh, three examples, not a big deal, just three examples about how we engineer wood, okay? And I personally believe by using this top-down approach instead of a bottom-up means you use nanofiber and build up things. Top-down use means you use the wood and you don't change the wood and you do things within the wood, okay? Changing the nickname, changing the hemicellulose, change the pores, you know, blocking some pores, and so on. And we find that there are a lot of very interesting, you know, uh, physics behind it and associated with all these, uh, you know, structures and the, and the physics, there are a lot of potential applications. So the first work is about lightweight structures. And I done this work through very close collaboration with a very good friend, Professor Tan Ni at the University of Maryland. Uh, in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, so uh, now let's, say, let's look at the mechanical property of paper or wood. Yeah? It's actually very boring. Yeah? I mean, mechanical property of paper is about a 20 to 60 megapath. And it's good for printing paper, but it's, you're not going to build a, 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 a building, for example, or a car using paper. And the wood mechanical property is almost the same. Yeah, it's like 20 to 60 megapath. It's good for some of the buildings, but you're not going to use it for the skyscraper, okay? Or you're not going to use it for uh, uh, you know lightweight cars as a, as a as a frame, right? That's because the two uh, features here. Why is that you have this very big, you know, building blocks? That's about 50 microns. But the second thing is that you have these very poor structures. You know, the porosity is almost about 50% in either structures, right? So, but at the same time, remember, this big fibers here is made of many, many smaller nanofibers. And this, the nanofiber is with a diameter. If you zoom in, the nanofiber is with a diameter of about 10 nanometer. And the strength is about 7 gigapass. You know, the best steel, the strength is about one to two gigapass, right, in your car. And the best carbon fiber strength is only like four gigapass or at the most five gigapass. Yeah. And many people are trying to develop a new technologies to replace steel, replace carbon fiber. And this material made by nature every day is with a strength up to seven gigapass. Okay. And at the same time, this is not by the primary bond, like a metallic bond as in metals, which it takes forever to decompose if you put it in nature. Right? This is actually made with hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond energy is very, very small, each one. But you do have all this hydrogen bond everywhere. You have about 2,000 hydrogen bond, you know, per, per molecular chance, per micron. And because of that, each bond can be broken. So that's, that means this material is very strong. But if you put it into nature, with the help of the sun and the water, this material can be decomposing. So this actually gives you a very good combination of excellent mechanical property and biodegradability. So it's very good for your use and it's very good when you're trying to dispose it. So that's another you know, very important feature 
of uh, nanofiber. So now, let's say if we want to use this nanofiber, what do we do? So we have to, you know, use uh, have to break them apart, right? So we done two kind of scaling behaviors. One is with diameter. So this actually uh, uh, was done by uh, uh, Hong Li Zhu. Now he's a professor in Northeastern University at uh, Boston. So uh, we were able to uh, break the fiber down to the smaller and the smaller scales and then make a paper again, right? So make uh, all kinds of papers using these bigger fibers, smaller fibers, and the smallest fibers, right? And then we do the stress strength test and then we can get this ultimate tensile strength when this material start to break. And we found out this mechanical strength indeed follow this kind of quasi whole patch related uh, equations it means increase the you know the decrease the diameter of the fiber you increase the mechanical strength dramatically you can almost increase the strength by up to hundred times because when you decrease the diameter of fibers you have less defects the material become much denser if you have a big fibers you have a, you know uh, in the limited interaction bond, the contact areas, and if you decrease this diameter, you have more interaction risk, and you have small defects and so on. So the other thing is the toughness or the uh, the the energy to 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 break this material, right? So you do the integral of this curve uh, under the stress strain uh, curve, and you get this toughness. Yeah, and we we find you know the toughness also increase as you decrease the diameter of the fiber. And this is untraditional because in if, if for the steel material, for example, yeah, the way to um, increase the strength is to change the processing uh, you know, uh, time and the cooling rate. When you cool it faster, you have a smaller grains, you have increased mechanical strength. Yeah. But by doing so, you actually sacrifice the ductivity and also the toughness. But in this material, we can increase the mechanical strength and the toughness at the same time. Yeah. This is very often uh, very likely due to the fact that this material is made of hydrogen bond, right? The hydrogen bond, each one is weak. So when you break it, because it's very weak, so it has a potential to be reformed. So instead of a break, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, right away for good, you know, they can be reformed with an adjacent hydrogen bond. Yeah. So this material is not broken right away as you're pulling this fiber apart against each other. So we also studied another kind of scaling behavior is the alignment, right? So you know that if you're trying to increase the mechanical property of uh, fiber materials, when you have you know, uh, 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 certain contact points, you know, the contact point gave you this mechanical strength, right? If you align them, you maximize the contact area you can increase the mechanical strength. So this indeed happened. We, we carried out this research uh, using this uh, bacteria cellulose fibers and we stretch them when it's still wet in water and we take it out and we dry it, right? And then hydrogen bond will be, ref will be formed and you have this increased mechanical strength up to even one gigapass. Okay, so this is actually better than many of the steels using this cellulose, the bio-based materials. We published this paper quite a few years ago. And remember this material, you you know, so this shows you that if you have a random behavior, a random arrangement, this is a mechanical property you have. If you have alignment, you have this kind of uh, much improved mechanical strength. The same thing is actually for the uh, toughness. So now we know that. In order to use these cellulose and other fibers, we want two things. We want the nanofiber. We want to use them as a line of fashion, right? And come back to my original point. You know, we always have manufacturing challenges. And for any technology to be useful, you have to overcome the manufacturing challenges. So if you use nanofiber, using the bottom up approach as I presented in the previous uh, two cases for the scanning behavior, either using, uh, uh, you know, alignment or using uh, a microfluidizer to break them apart, that use about 98% of water. And, you know, that's a lot of energy associated with that. So remember, cellulose very often come from trees, right? And they are actually partially aligned. Wood trees actually in a tropic structure. They grow at a certain directions. And the building block is the cellulose nanofibers. 
So we are very lucky to propose uh, this concept quite a few years ago. We have a patent on this. Is that let's use nanofiber as they are in wood. Okay, but let's try not to follow what the paper industry is doing. In the paper industry, they take the wood, they cut into small pieces, and they do this uh, uh, pulp treatment, right, to remove the nickname. They have to cut them into very small pieces so they get a very good diffusion of the chemicals to take the nickname away. But in this case, we want to use the structure, this anisotropic structure. So in this innovation, we remove some of the nickname so the wood itself become soft. At the same time, we apply mechanical force to uh, break them down, right? So by doing so, uh, mechanical force to break down the, 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 the channels, and you have this densified structure. So by doing so, you have all these align, uh, nanofibers inside, and they're aligned. So we indeed get actually much better uh, mechanical properties and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, the whole structure is with a density of about 1.3 and 1.6 or 1.5 a gram per centimeter cube. It's much denser than the regular wood, the starting wood. But the density is still six times smaller than most of the steels, right? So this is actually what happened in the laboratory. Uh, it, it's actually very simple, yeah. Uh, you just take the wood, you just cook it using chemicals, using some temperature, and the wood will basically the nickname, just like you wash your cloth, the nickname will be leached out, right? And the wood will be soft and you press it. You can actually not much pressure, about five megabat, right? And again, during the drying process, the hydrogen bond formed and you have this um, very strong tough material. So this is actually what happened in the laboratory. Again, it's just like wash cross, right? So what's happening here is that we're using this sodium hydroxide, right? To this is the nickname, uh, 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 you know, uh, building blocks. It's actually a very complex amorphous structure. And in one case, right, they can actually introduce these hydrophilic groups. So that means this material will start to like water and it can dissolve into water. In the other case, you can use hydroxide groups to break this kind of acyl group, right? You can break down this very large marker molecules of nickname into small molecules, right? When they are small, they are easier to leach out to actually dissolve into the water and you can remove that very rigid nickname, right? So this is actually what happened on the uh, composition studies. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, nickname is, you know, uh, about 50% of the original nickname. And the cellulose in this case still, you know, remain most of uh, the original mass. That's what we uh, wanted. We want to use the cellulose. We don't want to use the nickname because they are causing problems for densification, right? So we do this uh, mechanical stress strain test. And this uh, is the uh, natural wood. This is the densified wood. So you can see the tensile strength uh, is increased more than 10 times. The toughness is also increased about 10 times. Because this material is very lightweight compared to steels and even the best lightweight metals, the specific strength of this densified wood is actually significantly better than um, than uh, uh, you know, titanium alloy. Uh, neither with uh, metals. And if we look into the structure, you see uh, uh, this is a natural wood, very big channels. They are actually defects from mechanical point of view. And you see how actually this, the cell uh, walls are wrinkled and lock each other from a very dense structures. And if you look at the very nanoscale, you do have this kind of alignment that maximize the interactions between the building blocks. And we've also done a lot of uh, other kinds of tests, such as bending, you know, you bend in different directions, you increase by a lot in compared with the natural wood. You know, for building applications, we care more about the compression, 
right? And we compress in three different directions, like in the gross direction, you know, perpendicular to the gross direction, so on. Yeah. Right? So they all increased dramatically compared to the natural wood. You know, for some applications, you know, stiffness is important. Some applications, scratch resistance is important. And sometimes, you know, the impact, you know, this uh, resistance is important. We've done some bullet test and we see the denser fed wood actually can catch the bullet other different ways, this natural wood, the bullets just pass through it, right? So what this test tells us, you know, we indeed uh, improve the mechanical uh, 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 properties in all aspects. And, you know, um, this is really come from the structure of these materials. Yeah? From the macroscopic scale, from the large scale, you have these aligned structures, very dense uh, structures without the pores. And it's made of the, 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 the tubular structures, so right? the cell is closed. So they also form this kind of uh, very good laminate structure and they are also aligned, right? Like the uh, very, um, each uh, tubes now is basically put uh, pressed into uh, kind of like a, 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 a pallet, right? And you have this nanoscale uh, fibers, uh, that's the building block. And the each nanofiber itself is made of all these molecular chains. Again, they're aligned. So you have a hierarchical alignment from the molecular scale all the way to the microscopic scale. So that gives you all this um, um, mechanical strength and toughness. Yeah. And uh, we believe the strength comes from the removal of defects. This aligned hydrogen bond based structure gives you this very good toughness. And this process is actually very universal. universal. So uh, that means you can apply this process to different kinds of trees, okay? Uh, either from oak trees, from poplar, from pine, you know, from very cheap, fast growth trees to very expensive, you know, uh, dense trees. And um, uh, uh, ultimately, you know, all these trees has the very similar building blocks. The difference is mainly in the macroscopic uh, scales. They have, some has a big pores, some has smaller pores. But after we densify it, they become the same structure. They all dense. The building block is all cellulose nanofibers and you have ligand inside. So that's basically get, they give you a very universal kind of mechanical behavior. And of course, we really interested in very straight, you know, you know trees with less leaves. Uh, I know Professor um, Jinnu is going to talk about the leaves. We, in this case, we actually we uh, uh, we want just the the the, the, the trunk itself, yeah, right? And uh, um, uh, the cost is about one hundred fifty dollar per uh, meter cube, and we actually won this ID one hundred award. Yeah. So I think the superwood actually can really enable a lot of technology uh, possibilities. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, we are lucky to uh, get the funding from uh, uh, DOE uh, in the United States to uh, work for the car integrations. The idea is very simple, yeah, right? When you drive your car, you think about this, your car weight more than yourself, yeah? So when you say, I'm going to drive a car, you are really driving a car. You're not driving yourself, yeah? But to save the weight, you really want to drive yourself, yeah? But then you don't get this, the, the, the safety. So you want, the, you want the lightweight car. At the same time, you want to have very good mechanical strength and toughness. So that's the motivation. On average, if you save energy, uh, save the weight by 10%, you can actually increase the energy efficiency about, about 8%, right? And if you are talking about the fly system, like airplanes, that's even more, right? If you save the weight, you can save more of the fuel and it can save more of the cost. And also for the skyscraper uh, buildings. And so this is uh, actually CNBC News. You talk about uh, in, in Tokyo, Tokyo, they're talking about the tallest wooden skyscraper buildings. But the normal wood will not be able to do the job, right? The mechanical strength is only 60 megapass instead of 600 megapass. So you have a 10x difference there. So we hope this super wood technology can address a lot of uh, uh, you know, energy efficiency uh, challenges uh, in lightweight materials beyond sustainability. Sustainability was our original, um, uh, um, uh, you know, a motivation. But I think this material, if we engineer it right, you, know, you can actually beat um, a lot of human-made uh, 
uh, materials like steel in this case. Okay, so um, you know transportation, as I mentioned, yeah, for cars, uh, you know, airplanes, uh, it's about forty percent of the total energy consumption, right? So you think about it, you are very often you are on the road, you are taking the train, you are right, uh, you are driving your car. That's actually you are spending a lot of you know you know consume a lot of energy. So you, when you are not a drive, when you are not travel, you are always very often stay inside a building, right? So actually building consumption is about 40%, uh, not 40% of total energy consumption. So I'm going to tell you, you know, how we can engineer wood for building technologies. In this case, we care about the light effect. We care about the thermal comfort, right? How can we see things in the daytime? Right? How can we have the best lighting effect? And how can we have the best thermal comfort? Right? So if you look at the building, right, and you have a windows, a window is a very bad component in terms of energy efficiency, right? But you like a window because they give you visibility, you know, uh, give you comfort and so on. And that's the other major energy uh, leakage that is your uh, envelope, the walls, right? Uh, either using the stainless steel or using some uh, uh, regular wood that actually don't give you the best thermal protection, right? So uh, again, as I said, it's about 40% of the total energy consumption. So this is a big deal, right? So if we can do anything related to building, in terms of energy, in terms of sustainability, that's going to be a very, very important uh, you know, impact. So my group has been working on this uh, uh, kinds of technologies for quite a few years. And the first work was by, uh, by uh, Ming Wei Zhu, uh, was a visiting scholar in my group at that time. You know, we invent this so-called transparent wood. And basically we remove the nickname that absorb the light and we fill with uh, uh, some centers or polymers to avoid the scattering centers. So you can actually get a very transparent, you know, very low thermal conductivity wood that can actually maintain the therm uh, optical comfort, but avoid thermal leakage, and it can increase the energy efficiency. We've also done a work called a thermal insulation wood. It's a structured material. In this case, we're talking about a nest scale of about 100 nanometers for thermal uh, management. By doing so, we can actually lower the thermal conductivity dramatically. And now this project is funded by DOE a BTO office. We're trying to commercialize this technology through so Invented Wood as well. So today I'm going to focus on this so-called radiation cooling wood. Okay, this is a cooling wood that when you put it on a roof, it's not going to heat your uh, house even in the hot to summer, but it's going to cool your house because of this radiation effect. Okay, because of the time, I'm going to uh, speak relatively fast for this concept. Okay, so now if you think about this is your house. Okay, this is a building, right? This is the you. This is the cloud. Okay, and far far away is the universe. That's actually very cold, right? And then you have the sun, which is very hot. Okay, it's 6,000 Kelvin. So now if, let's say if there's no sun, okay? And you should always feel cold because the universe is so cold, right? And, and if you look at this cloud, you have this transmission windows and from eight to 30 microns, you have this very high transmitting windows. And now let's say your house is a room temperature, say um, 300 Kelvin. And this is the black body uh, radiation curve. Right? So then this you say this this window is transparent, right? So you see that if there's no sun, okay, and your house is going to radiate all the heat through this transparent window, yeah. And you're gonna have actually a very cool building, right? Even in the hottest, even in the summer. But the problem is actually because of the, in the summer, you have this high flux energy uh, you know, input from the solar, which is again is a black body radiation. And it's 6,000, so the center is in range of the visible light, right? So about the red cooling in your house is really about how can we reduce the heating, the increase, the cooling. So overall, you have net output of the energy instead of the input into your building. So 
we want to make this material white so it doesn't absorb the solar energy. Lignin is a component in the wood which we always don't want, okay, for, for now. In the future, maybe we'll want to engineer lignin, but for now, we always want to deal something with lignin. In the previous case, I said we remove some lignin. In this case, we completely remove the lignin. So you see, this is a lignin slurry. It's completely black. It's very black, uh, you know, uh, it's actually a wonderful material. I think there's a lot of potential for this material. Yeah? People haven't really explored yet. But in this case, we're trying to remove it, right? So this is absorption of the lignin and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's just black, right? That's why, you know, if you put the wood in the roof, it's going to absorb the sun, it's going to heat your house, which is bad from energy efficiency point of view in the summer. So this is actually a completely denignified wood uh, we demonstrated a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And you may think this is actually very trivial and actually to remove the nigni from a very big piece of wood without destroying the structure is actually very, very challenging. You know, there's nothing to hold them together if you remove them, right? Then hydrogen bond formed when you actually drive the water away and you have to get them apart, but still they're still very porous. Yeah. So it's actually a very, very complicated task. Yeah. And we were, you know, after a lot of effort, we were able to make this kind of a tofu shaped wood, okay? If you come to my lab, it's really like a big tofu, okay? Very white, it's kind of delicious actually. <laughs> uh, it's actually made of completely nanocellulose. And remember actually people are putting nanocellulose in, in, in food already. And, uh, you know, I put the 20% of a transparent cellulose in your wood. In this case, we have a white color because we still have a lot of scatterings uh, because of this macroscopic arrangement, right? So now let's look at the spectrum, right? It's very white, it's very obvious, right? And then we measure the reflections. It's actually uh, has a very high haze. It means reflection scattering in all directions. And if you look at the uh, uh, transmittance, of course it's very white. Yeah? So the transmittance is actually very, very small, almost zero, yeah? and the very, very small absorption as well. So that means, you know, if you put it on a roof, most of the energy will not be transmitted, will not be absorbed, it will be reflected back, yeah? right? It has a very high reflectance in the solar energy uh, range from, you know, visible all the way to 2.5 microns. That's what the solar energy uh, spectrum is. Yeah? So if you do this integral, right, based on the spectrum, you should know how much is the solar absorption if you put this kind of wood in your roof, okay? So it's about 53 watts per meter square. Okay, now look at the infrared. This material is actually completely black. You know, you and I will not believe so because it looks white in the visible. But this material has a lot of, you know, functional groups, has a lot of CO, CH, OH bonds, right? They will vibrate in the infrared. So that means they're gonna absorb energy in the infrared. So when you have a very high absorption, that means they're gonna have very high emis emission as well. The absorp absorptivity is the same as the emissivity. So because of that, you're gonna have a very large cooling effect, right? So this is the infrared range, okay? And you do the integral from visible all the way to the infrared. It's mainly the inner infrared range. You get this huge cooling power. The energy goes away, okay, from your roof. So this number is much larger than absorption, which is 53 in the previous slide, right? So now let's add everything together. You know, in the real case, you have convection, uh, you have conduction, and 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 you have actually back uh, radiation from the environment and so on. But by taking this, you know, uh, wide window, uh, you know, this eight to thirteen micron windows, if you do all these things together, you still get a net emission power of about fifty eight watts, right? So for a ten percent, you know, a solar cell, uh, you get about hundred watts for about eight hours to ten hours. And this is a 24 hours operation. Yeah. So this is actually even better than most of the solar cells from 24 hour operation point of view. So this work was done through collaboration with Rongwei Yan and uh, uh, Xiaobo Yin uh, from the University of Colorado at that time. And we done some real time tests and uh, you know, confirm the measurement and you know, agree with the calculations and so on. Yeah. 
So this material at the end of the day, very different with other radiation cooling materials. The radiation cooling concept uh, really started by, uh, you know, uh, you know um, Professor Sang Hui um, from uh, Stanford University uh, using, uh, you know, semiconductor structures and uh, there are quite other interesting works using, you know, polymer beads and using multi structures and so on. And uh, this material is, uh, is wood. So intrinsically it's a structure material. And for buildings, you want the mechanical strength, you want the structure uh, material. So we see that in this case, the mechanical strength is also like 400 megapass, and it's very much better in terms of scratch resistance. When you use it for the building, you care about the scratch. You know, people is going to scratch it, you know, you have cats, you know, you know, things like that. Yeah. You care about scratch resistance and the other kinds of mechanical properties as well. Yeah. And this is the specific mechanical strength. Just like before, it's also better than the uh, lightweight um, uh, uh, metals. And this material also has very, very beautiful colors, just like a pure white, okay? And I, I think, you know, uh, this may have applications even beyond this so-called radiation cooling. And we've done uh, this building uh, energy efficient calculation uh, through collaboration with Professor Enina Sibrik uh, at the University of Maryland. And the, the idea, you know, is that, you know, using this um, material in certain regions, you can save energy about, you know, up to 35%, okay? Uh, you know, uh, for certain areas like those, you know, like Austin, you know, Phoenix, only have a very dry and hot weather. So um, this really indicate, you know, if we can engineer this material uh, to, uh, uh, to play with the optical properties like transparent wood, the, the 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 thermal properties, uh, like insulation wood, or this you know, like the uh, uh, light and the thermal coupling, uh, you can have this cooling uh, of wood. And this is just one second example. So in addition to super wood cooling wood, I'm going to give the last example uh, very quickly. It's called ionic wood, okay, or called nano ionic wood or fluidic wood. It's about a wood using wood to transport ions, transport waters, transport other fluidics in the guided version with a much enhanced speed, with much better regulation. For example, if we make a channel much smaller, we can selectively transport one ion versus the other kind of ions. So you can start to build a charge on one side, and you can also promote the transfer number, for example, in lithium ion batteries. That is always the key to get the fast charge batteries. So I think, you know, natural wood is doing this every day already, right? I mean, if you look outside your window, right, you have the trees, they, they, they are, right now they are pumping water, right? They're pumping potassium, sodium ions as nutrition for the trees to grow, right? And they have very interesting hierarchical structures. They have this larger pores, diameter channels, right? and they have this smaller channels. And they have peace on the cell walls and so on. And I think there are a lot of works done for this uh, classical materials. And when we enter this field, we ask this kind of questions, right? So how can we use this nanoscale behavior? For example, in this case, we open them up. We charge the nanofiber apart. So they start to repel each other. You open up the small channels and you get this so-called nano-ionic transport behaviors, right? And remember, this material has a lot of hydroxyl groups. That's the glucose chains, right? So can we modify the structure to make them more surface charged when they you know, soak in water? They are more likely to be dissociated. So you have more surface charge, negative surface charge. Then they gave us a chemical modifications in addition to the physical modifications, right? And we also hopefully we can benefit from these hierarchical structures. Right, they have this big channel and the smaller channels for things such as solar dissonation, water dissonations. They can transport the water, not the vapor. You can transport this ion, not that ion, and so on. So I give you a very quick example about the solar dissonation. Right, in this case, you know, the idea is to heat the light on to the surface of the wood. In this case, the wood surface is uh, uh, is blackened by carbonization. It's very black. On the, but only on the very set top surface. So when the light is heated on the surface, it's going to be absorbed. And because wood has a very poor thermal conductivity, 
it's porous material, right? So it's, the heat is going to be focused on the surface. The surface will be from, become very hot. The vapor will be formed, right? Will be evaporated. And the water, let's say, under the wood from an ocean, for example, it's going to be pumped up through these channels of the wood. So now you have this continuous flux from the sea water to the clean vapor. You can constantly generate clean water using this solar energy. So we've done this using wood as well. Just like many other materials, you know, may, maybe many people don't talk about it, you know, you know, in the beginning, now people pay more and more attention to this, is that, you know, this kind of device operated very well, but after a certain time, the salt will start to accumulate and it's going to make this black material completely white. And then there's no absorption. The channels are blocked. So you have this so-called salt accumulation problem, right? So here we're using this uh, 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 balsa wood. In a balsa wood, they have this bimodular distribution. You have this very large pores, you know, up to hundreds of microns. And you have this very tiny pores, like, like, uh, like 30 microns. Yeah. And in the cell, we have all these piece structures. So the idea here is that on the solar energy uh, heat on the surface, the water will be evaporated through these small channels. The source will dissolve back through these big channels and we done some modeling, uh, we do some experiment. We indeed find if you use a box of wood, this bimodular structure can help you resolve this salt accumulation problem. See? I think this is actually very, very important, you know, from the long time operation point of view. So that's actually about the big channels, right? And the things become more interesting at the nano size. Okay, I just give you a very quick example. I think this is just the beginning of many, many possibilities. Okay, in this case, you think about, you know, if you have a charged surface, okay, if you immerse it into, a, 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 you know, ionic, uh, uh, you know, a salt, like a sodium chloride salt solution, right? So let's say this, this the surface of the wood is electrically charged. It's going to attract the positive ion to the surface, right? They form this so-called double layer with a distance as about like one nanometer for a typical sodium hydroxide solutions, right? So in the traditional wood, the channel is in like hundreds of microns. So that's a microscopic region, right? So there's no regulation. Ion transport is just like a transport through a bulk solution. Yeah. The, the cell wall, the wood wall has nothing to do with it. Okay, now let's say we open up the nanochannels. Now the channel diameter is very, very small, a few nanometers, right? So in this case, when the ion is trying to transport through this channel, very small channel, it's just like you trying to go through a very small, uh, you know, aisles with two walls. You're going to be influenced by whatever on the surface of the channel, right? So for example, if you have an active ion on the surface, it's going to repel the negative ion to go through yeah? You're going to attract more of the positive ion to go through yeah? So this is so-called nanoionics, right? So if you study this kind of behavior, this is what happened here, yeah, right? The, the double layer distance, you know, decreased as you increase the salt concentration. So this is the concentration of the salt. On the concentration is very high, you enter into this linear regime, right? The transport is the same as the bulk solution. There's nothing interesting here. But when you decrease the concentration, or when you, uh, when you increase the concentration, or you decrease the diameter of the channel, you know, you're going to have a much, you know, enhanced conductivity because the ions inside the channel is going to be always match the surface concentrations, right? So no matter how little ion you have in the bulk, you always have a lot of ions to actually in, 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 the, in the channels. So this is actually become extremely interesting already. Yeah? And I believe this material can be even more interesting when you go to this molecular scale, yeah? which I don't have time to talk today. Okay, so in this nanofibers, we indeed observe this behavior, this classical behavior is kind of nano-ionic behaviors, right? So this is the, you know, processed cellular uh, nanofibers or processed nano wood, okay? And you have this, Transport behavior, right? This is the nano behavior. This is the bulk behavior, right? 
As I said, we can even make the surface charge even more by using uh, changing the hydroxide groups to uh, carboxyl groups. So this group is more, even more easy to be dissociated in. So you have more surface charge. So even with the same diameter, you have more surface charge. You have more surface charge on the cell wall. You have more charge in the channel. You have more conductivity. You have higher conductivity. That is so-called you know, enhancement of conductivity due to the surface charge effect. And to use this kind of behavior, we have to block the big channels. So when you do this kind of experiment, we have two choices. We either densify it, or we either block the channel by infiltrating some polymer into the big channels. So this is a very quick example to show you how we use this kind of nano-ionic behaviors using wood. And remember, the wood is very easy to process here. You can cut them into different shapes, into different angles. So in this case, we can cut wood in this way. The, the channels are aligned in these directions. And you have what is surface charge, right? So now let's do this device, so-called thermoionic electric devices. So you have the temperature gradient. So the temperature is going to drive the positive ion through this negative channel. So the positive ion is going to be here. The negative ion is going to be here. So now you have this voltage build up, right? So you can charge the double layer. You can just like you charge the battery. So if you have actually have a redox reaction on both sides, you can actually get a continuous operation just like a battery. So by using this nano channel, we can get actually record high CP coefficient because of a very low thermal conductivity. The overall is very similar like this CPAC efficiency. The CPAC coefficient is actually very, very high compared to other ionic based devices. So we can use this wood to harvest energy from low grade heat, like a you know, couple of tens of degrees CC. So my group uh, has been working on other technologies. I gave you three examples, super wood, cooling wood, and ionic wood. And there are many other possibilities like a battery wood, you know, ion human, ion human interface, like Professor Jigan saw last week, give a uh, extremely, um, uh, you know, exciting talks on how to use ions. Then maybe the scenarios can serve as an interesting material platform to use for that purpose. And as I said, we have a company called Invent Wood uh, to commercialize uh, these uh, technologies. Invent Wood has licensed all the patents related to these wood technologies and the scenarios technologies. And we also look for potential uh, collaborations uh, through uh, the company. And as I said, we want to go beyond sustainability. I showed you a lot of very exciting, actually, uh, structures with outstanding performances. And remember, wood is old materials. And the people has a lot of knowledge about how to process it, right? In the paper industry, in the lumber industry, right? So, and from the very bottom, you can engineer the seeds, right? You can do genetic engineering. You can plant the wood has more ligny or less ligny, right? So I think that a lot of uh, possibilities. And now if you use AI, right, to do, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, images, couple of image structures with the properties, the AI can play a very important role to facilitate uh, and speed up the discovery and the manufacturing. So I think that a lot of possibilities here. So uh, this is actually a slides, um, uh, the video from uh, Nature, uh, just showed this is accessible from uh, uh, YouTube. So, so in the future, you know, uh, a sustainable future will need uh, the use of this sustainable materials. Yeah. So the question is, do we have enough materials, right? And this is a video I will let you watch. How many trees are there in a forest? What about a country? How about in the whole world? The answer, we now know, is that our planet is home to 3.04 trillion trees. So on average, we have about 400 trees worldwide. And so I think that's really uh, uh, enough material for us to play with. Yeah. So um, um, with that, I would like to acknowledge my, uh, my students. Uh, the Superwood is really uh, uh, developed by uh, uh, Jianwei and uh, Zhao, uh, Zhao Ji, and together through, through collaboration with Professor Tennis Group. The Kuning Wood is uh, done by Kenny. Uh, she's going to be a professor in Purdue University. 
uh, with Swiming and uh, through collaboration with Xiaobo uh, uh, and Ronggui. And uh, the Ionic Wood we done uh, is again by Tian uh, Tianli and uh, uh, through collaboration with uh, uh, you know NIST, uh, Dr. Rob Bibers Group, and so on. Yeah. We also acknowledge some other collaborators and so on. Thank you so much for your attention. Wow, great. Liang Bing, really, really great talk. Yeah, I enjoy very much for this magic wood. You really make a lot of things, you know, uh, out of my imagination. So, yeah, it, uh, could you please close the share screen? Then we can go to the question part. A lot of people was online waiting for your answers. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah, so let's see. We have uh, many questions from different places. Yeah, the first question is Lily from Beijing. Uh, thank you, Professor Hu. Uh, one question. Wood is a great element, but it is hard to integrate with other materials to enhance the performance. How to overcome this problem or limitations? Uh, integration is always a, a challenge. Yeah. And uh, so ultimately, wood is a soft material. So, I mean, when you integrate a different ways to, to integrate, I mean, mechanically, it's soft. So you can just mechanically join them together, yeah, right? Or you can shape them, uh, you know, by, you know, cutting into shapes and then you can lock them together, right? Or you can use glues, right? And uh, um, yeah, you are right. Because the wood, traditional wood has a lot of pores. You can use glue easier. For the super wood, it's so dense, so, so flat. You, you do have challenges, yeah, but I don't think that, I mean, you know, people are smart, yeah, they're always solutions, yeah, as long as it's, it's, it's a good material, I think. <laughs> <laughs> For sure it is, you already made such a, you know, big progress. I think later, you know, many technologies can come in and make some kind of magic. Mm -hmm. the, the second question is, Professor Wu, very impressive talk. Uh, for the super light wood, can it be mass, uh, mass production? How about the cost? I think this one must um, more curious for the commercialization of this light. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, uh, so you mentioned wood is uh, doing this uh, manufacturing and uh, uh, commercialization effort. Uh, we have a project funded by DOE, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I think you know. Uh, one of the major motivation for using wood nanomaterial is because it's a potential advantage in mass production. Mm -hmm. right? You think about uh, you think about the other nanomaterials. I, I work a lot on nano carbon nanotubes. Yeah. You have to <laughs> first. you have to synthesize this material first, and followed by purification. You know, uh, and and then scale up and so on. And this material you don't need to fabricate. You just just plant the seed. Yeah. And Alice was, yesterday, her bamboo in front of her, her house, right? Alice, you said your you bamboo can grow one meter per day, <laughs> right? Bamboo can grow very fast, yeah. So I, I think mass production shouldn't be a, 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 a problem in the long run. It, it may take time, yeah. But I, I think, you know, I think, you know, it's in the right direction. And the cost, uh, we done some uh, uh, estimate there, it's going to be cheaper than then the com material will compete here, yeah, uh, such as steel, right? Of course, it's going to be more expensive than wood. But again, mm -hmm. if you go compare with wood, you know, the price very vary a lot. You have very expensive wood that grow, they takes hundreds of years to grow. Right? <laughs> That's right. Like a, yeah. like a hongmu, right? It's very, it take a long time to grow, yeah. But remember, the process we're doing here, we can start with very cheap, fast growth wood. They only take three years to grow. After mm -hmm. this vacation, this wood is even better than Hongmu, okay? Then the, the best, the best wood, you know, you can, uh, uh, why it's expensive? Because it takes a long time to grow, yeah? Why it takes, mm -hmm. well, because of the structure is very dense. So now by doing this process, actually we speed up the manufacturing by nature, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would like to point out that the things we present right now are for wood, right? But this knowledge can be used for bamboos, can be used for many other biomass materials. I think it's really the body impact shouldn't be limited to one kind of wood or one kind, you know, we should really think about how can we use nature materials to really mm -hmm. enjoy, and at the same time, 
take serious consideration of manufacturer, uh, manufacturer as a key aspect. Thank you. Yeah, it is really, really interesting. I also in uh you know interested in this part too, because you know there are many kind of factories already there. So if you can, you know, merge your uh technology, your new technology with a traditional one, that may be, you know, mass production costs can be also yeah, get low down. Yeah. So it's very good. Yeah, so we go the third one from Yuri. Uh, Yuri was uh, Google Teach. He, he is very excited for your magic talk. He is uh, enjoying the talk. So the question is to you, would be that limitations? Yeah, no material is perfect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can we really replace all structure metal sheets with a uh, uh, densified wood? If not, what does prevent? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Rui. A very good question. Uh, I'm very glad you are in the audience. Uh, thank you. And um, question, uh, yeah, wood definitely has a lot of, uh, of problems, uh, you know, to prevent for a broader range of applications. You know, wood, you know, uh, like, you know, plastic and metals, they can be uh, formed easily by, uh, you know, extrusion or uh, casting, right? They can make it in, into different shapes and form it very easily. And the wood is more like a thermal setting material. Yeah? You cannot, you cannot, uh, you know, punch it into a shape, right? And that, that will only break it, right? So I think that's one of the major limitations. And, and that's actually a mechanical issue. Uh, I, I collaborate a lot with Tenny. And we, we face this uh, limitation all the time. Yeah. So hopefully our next breakthrough will be uh, about this. OK, because Yuri has been asked by uh, Jigang, Professor Jigang So, as, uh, don't ask for what you uh, Maxine can do for you. Ask what you can do for Maxine. Yeah, so maybe you uh, also can ask like this. Don't ask what you know, the limitation for this. Ask what you can do for wood. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, uh, definitely right. Um, every material has limitations. And uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it is. Uh, the uh, next one is Wang from Nanjia Agriculture University. Professor Ku, uh, thank you for your fantastic talk. You really make magic wood much more than our imagination. My question is, uh, is it possible to make all kinds of wood by your technology or just a few <laughs> selected kind of wood? So, <clears throat> I mean, the more we're looking, working with this material, the more um, as we look, as we're facing new challenges, and we find a lot of opportunities. Yeah, it's just like a people, right? Every people is different. Every tree is different. Even the same kind of tree, if they plant in different distance, okay. Let's say if the tree plant like this distance or that distance, as the distance increase, okay, the tree will actually grow faster they will not compete nutrition and sunlight anymore, right? So actually, if you look at the microstructure, the cell walls, uh, cells are much bigger and the rings are much larger and the speed is much faster. Yeah. So, and there's a, you know, when we work for technology, so always there's a structure property relationship, right? So if the structure is different, the property will be different there. And the technology associated with the property will be very, very different. For example, just give you one example here. And then we talk about the solid destination, right? Using the basalt wood, we can remove the salt because this is a bimodular structure. You have the big channels, you have smaller channels. If you're using pine, they have more uniform distribution of the channels, you won't be able to do that. Yeah, so, you know, I think, you know, uh, that's why I think in the potential future, I mean, in the future, because you know, there are so many kinds of trees, right? They all depend on <laughs> the weather right? and so on. I think the AI, artificial intelligence, may help us sort out this relationship um, more, more quickly. And the people start to bring this principle up already. And then, the, now what? Right? So let's say if I really want this kind of tree, right? I mean, you can plan this kind of tree with a well-planned distance, and, and so on, right? You can either do gene engineering, you can do genetic modification, right? So I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities. And, you know, we are, you know, we are work from, I'm from material science department and, you know, you will work on nanomaterials. And, the, you know, there are a lot of people actually working for wood, like plant scientists, plant science, right? And they're working on 
gene engineering, you know, if we all work together, I think there will be a lot of new opportunities. Yeah. And uh, I don't think so. After this talk, I think you will get many invitations from the agricultural farm department because you really open a new window, you know, uh, for them. Like he says that that's really out of imagination. You know, normally the people working in this uh, this side they didn't think you know in this way can get nanotechnology well involved with a traditional wood. That's a very good you know start. Let's I, keep I, on going. I would say I personally benefited from this a lot already, and uh, I mean I I don't know anything about the wood. Um, I say uh, six years ago, yeah, and I learned this a lot with visiting students, uh, visiting scholars, collaborators. They are the they are my uh, 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 handbook for uh, wood structures, you know, chemistry and so on. Yeah, and I, I think you are Alice, you are definitely right. Yeah, we need to work together. From completely different uh, disciplines, right? On in this kind of uh, um, uh, collaboration, we can really uh, come out from our comfort zone, and you know, be shocked by new uh, uh, you know fields, and then come out of this uh, like inter like interfacial ideas, you know, you, the ideas that come only at the interface. Yeah. It is right. That's why I can ask the task. You why there's so many different, you know, scientists from different fields with exchange ideas, get a, a, like the brainstorm, you know. Yeah, got some new idea came in, you know, or come out of the comfort zone to see something new. Okay, we still have one more question. That's a pretty long question. Zhang Yi from NTU. Where primates and technology, what's the environmental impact of the chemical in the treatment, how is the pollution compared to the paper making, which, you know, uh, generates heavy pollutions? Uh, so then the second part, okay, you can answer the first part. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I'm, I, I, I really don't like chemistry because I, uh, uh, my training is on physics, so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Uh, now I have to deal with a lot of chemistry. Uh, you know, I read a lot of uh, books and, and so on. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't have too much insight on this, but I know that the paper industry is making a lot of progress, yeah, making tremendous progress. You know, now the current paper industry, paper mills, the manufacturing plants are completely different with many years ago, right? So there are different kind of standards. It's really about regulation and the standard, right? If you have a standard, if you regulate the standard, and the people will follow, and this pollution problem can be dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know the, the I think we have enough understanding and knowledge about how to avoid the the high dose use of those uh, uh, sulfide based chemistries, you know, and uh, and you know if you do this very careful, uh, you know, recycling, you can deal with that. I mean, I work on batteries a lot. I visited some battery plants. And you would think you can use a lot of organic solvent and so on such as NMP, it can be fully recycled, yeah? and they have zero uh, uh, waste. I, I visited some battery plants before, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I don't know, I answer your questions, but you know, the chemistry we're using, you are right, we're definitely, the chemistry we're using are not new chemistries, we're using old chemistries, but we're using in a very careful way so that we can get the structure we want. So the idea for us to move forward is to integrate the existing infrastructure of how people journey with the waste. Second question. Okay, then we go to the second part of this question. A lot of ancient China agriculture uh, architectures are made of wood. Dimension stability and the fire, you know, retardants are always a problem. How would you density fire wood make a difference? And that's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, again, very good question. Yeah. Uh, I think dimensional stability and the fire retardants will be improved. Uh, for the same reason, and let's say if you do talk about the super wood, right? Uh, fire propagate uh, faster because you hold this pause inside, right? Ultimately, the super wood will be burned if you put it in, in the wood in the fire after a long time, it's going to be burned. But the fire retardance is going to improve dramatically. We have a publication uh, uh, last year by that work uh, through collaboration with um, the fire protection department, and, and that's actually a, a department in our university 
the rank very high because uh, you know uh, they, they they focus on the file uh, uh, resistant studies. Yeah, dimensionality, dimension stability. I think it's the same thing because now you don't have this power structure. Yeah, you would have better dimension stability. <clears throat> but I do need to point out, you know, the water water is the major uh, enemy for centenaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the coatings functionalizations. Uh, uh, into certain depths of wood is going to be uh, important. You see those uh, electrical poles, right? Dian uh, Xingan, right? They, you know, they can, mm. I, I was always wonder. I mean, they use that uh, for a very dangerous purpose. I mean, if the, if they fall, it's going to be disaster, yeah. But, you know, if they, if they uh, uh, corrode over time, yeah. But it seems like people have a very good solution for, you know, avoid, you know, preventing this corrosion and, Dimension stability by in, infiltration some um, chemicals inside. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. Yeah, I think we have a the question. Okay. Oh, oh my God. We have a, we have a one more. Yeah. So, uh, Yan Niu from Xi'an Jiao Tong University, Professor Wu, thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. What's the advantage of all the material for flexible electronics and wearable devices compared with hydrogen? Oh, yeah, last week was a hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I think uh, they, <clears throat> uh, cellulose can make it into a hydrogen as well. Yeah, I mean, that a lot of people are using cellulose instead of polymers to make a hydrogen, and because they are very long and uh, they, they, they can be surface uh, functionalized and you know, hydroxyl groups, not water. And uh, I think they can be a, 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 a new family member for hydrogen technologies. And uh, I, I think we, we should uh, uh, all work together. <laughs> um, uh, flexible electronics uh, very often um, uh, is about a printing. Like if you talk about a process, yeah. So flexibility allows you to do rotary printing. Yeah? And the paper is a very good printing material because it, it can, uh, really absorb the solvent uh, because of the power structure. Yeah, so we have done a lot of work before for flexible electronics. Uh, just because you know in US this flexible electronics uh, area is uh, not as popular as in Asia countries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think Yan, Alice, you asked it last time. And nobody is asking this question. Why I'm working on wood? I, I hope to use this uh, <laughs> to, to answer if you don't mind. <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay, we have time to discuss on that. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Now we, yeah, I will give you a certification for this wonderful talk. I, that's, I can ask the talk the tradition. Because on this, I can ask the talk, so we really want to invite the top scientists to uh, share the latest, uh, you know, results and technologies, connect the world and the universe, and that everyone know, you know, all this technology was going to change the world. So, Liang Bing, that's for you, the electrical version. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, very, uh, very honored uh, to present along with the most distinguished scientists in the world. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay, great.